last video, we discussed the problem of locating Latin America in space, of saying where it is. We noted that its borders are fluid and uncertain, and may or may not include places such as the Falklands Malvinas, Miami, Florida, or Highland, Peru, depending on the discipline or approach we take. We said then that it is best to think of Latin America as an idea, rather than as a thing that can be pinned down or described with any confidence. Moreover, this is an idea that is, uh, has its own history. It was invented at a particular time and place, 19th century France, but no longer has the same content today that it did then. The idea of Latin America is constantly changing, continually being reinvented. Our task is to chart the relationship between this slippery idea and the diverse histories and experiences that it tries to encompass. Identifying when Latin America came into existence is equally tricky. One answer might be to examine the history of the idea since its invention and to think about how and why it became popular during the 20th century. Another answer might be to suggest that Latin America still doesn't exist, that it's a political and social project that remains incomplete. Both these approaches offer fruitful lines of inquiry. But finally, if somewhat anachronistically, yet another answer would be to trace the idea of Latin America as it has been projected back into the past, long before the term itself existed. In which case, one date immediately jumps out as an almost mythical point of origin for Latin America, 1492. More specifically, the early morning of October the 12th, 1492, would have been the precise instant that Latin America began. This being the moment at which the Genoese sailor, Christopher Columbus, along with the crew of his three small ships, found themselves somewhere off the coast of an island in what is now the Bahamas. 1492 is a date that resonates through history at least if we think of history as a sequence of punctual events that can be identified in terms of days, months and years. For the Western Hemisphere, 1492 marks the great dividing line between pre-colonial, pre-Hispanic and thus pre-Latin America versus the long periods of colonial rule and post-colonial legacy that follow. Indeed, we refer to indigenous civilizations, practices, beliefs, and artifacts from before that moment as pre-Columbian, before Columbus. 1492 is one of the few dates, perhaps the only one, to trip off the tongue of just about every educated person in the Americas, and even worldwide, thanks to ditties such as, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. The event and its central figure are commemorated in paintings, statues, memorials, as well as the names of streets, cities, this Canadian province, and even, with Colombia, an entire country. Yet things are not, of course, so simple. In the first instance, as we've already noted, 1492 only comes to assume the importance it has now much later. It's a key element of a narrative that's only constructed in the aftermath of subsequent events. Whatever may have begun on October the 12th of that year, the vast majority of the inhabitants of the Americas would have remained utterly unaware for decades, in some cases centuries. Nor, in an age of difficult communications and restricted information flows, would most Europeans receive the news or find their lives affected until long after. Columbus and his crew returned in March 1493. To put this another way, colonialism was an uneven process, and it would continue to be so, making a mockery of any conception of history as steady progression from one epoch to another. In the second instance, the very notion of a founding event erroneously implies that there's some organic, even inevitable, link between what we have now and what happened then. 
And there's no reason why history should have unfolded the way it did. After all, this is not the first time that Europeans had crossed the Atlantic. Vikings were in what is today eastern Canada some five centuries earlier, and yet their settlement left little to no long-lasting impact. Moreover, the first several decades of Spanish exploration and colonization in the Americas were decidedly precarious, sometimes because of indigenous resistance, sometimes because of natural adversity, still other times because of infighting among the conquistadors themselves. History might well have turned out otherwise, and 1492 could easily have ended up just being a date like any other. More importantly, in the third instance, Columbus had no idea that he was founding anything. It was at best a purely accidental foundation of which its main architect was and would remain unaware. For all the praise and vilification he has subsequently received for what he did, whether we call it discovery or conquest, Columbus himself never recognized that he had done it. He went to his grave with the notion that he had charted a new route to the Indies, that is, to East Asia. As he says in the journal of his first voyage, however enticed he is by the various islands he, come across, he comes across, he's still determined to continue to the mainland, to the city of Kinsei, a port in what is now China, and to give your majesties, the king and queen of Castiles, letters to the great Khan and return with his reply. There are moments when Columbus's insistence that he has almost accomplished his self-declared mission sounds like denial of the facts on the ground. We often sense his perplexity that the new terrain and its people are not quite as he had imagined they would be. His constant search for gold, his testament less for greed, which he denounces in the behavior of fellow Captain Martin Pinson, than to his belief that close by should be the great civilization the travelers to the east, such as Marco Polo, had previously reported. Hence also his frequent distrust when the natives seem to tell him otherwise, and his repeated assertions that he can never verify. For instance, there must be large settlements inland here with hosts of people and things of great profit. In effect, Columbus was himself pre-Columbian. Columbus was unsure as to what, if anything, he had achieved. He shows a palpable anxiety as he tries to convince his crew, his sponsors, and perhaps even himself, that this journey was worth the effort. His journal is no neutral record of a set of experiences. It's an exercise in self-justification. From the start, for instance, Columbus has to deal with the reluctance of his own men to whom he provides a false reckoning of the distance traveled as they traverse the ocean. Shortly before landfall in the Americas, they're practically mutinous. They could contain themselves no longer, we're told. And his assurances to the king and queen are an effort in repeated special pleading, given that he has signally failed to prove his wager on a trade route to the east. He turns back for home, just as he declares that the enterprise now appears so splendid in extent and of such high promise. Yet apart from a few trinkets and some no doubt miserable, hardly magnificent indigenous captives, all he can offer their majesties is this promise of rewards deferred to some unknowable future. But we too cannot be all that certain of the significance, if any, of 1492. The literary critic and philosopher Zvetan Todorov argues that Columbus's journey was as important for defining a European sense of identity as for any impact it went on to have for the Americas themselves. Todorov claims that the so-called discovery of America is best seen as the discovery or invention of the modern European self via the American other. As such, it marks the beginning of the modern era Modernity begins in 1492 on a remote Caribbean island. This is a decent way of understanding things, if somewhat narcissistic, but it's just one narrative among many. Let's interject a question or two here. 
get a pen and paper and jot down responses to the following prompts. First, I wonder what impression you had of Columbus before you looked at his own account of 1492. Had you been led to believe, for instance, that he was a hero or a villain? What narrative had you found convincing? Second, I'm interested in how your thoughts may have changed after reading about events in, more or less, his own words. Were you more persuaded of his heroism or more convinced of his villainy? Or perhaps something else? Pause the video, write down your answers. I fancy a mug of tea, but I'll be back. So, what did you put? I'm sure you had a variety of answers, but in my experience these days, many people are quick to point the finger at Columbus. And yet, that's not the story that I at least was taught when I was growing up. Is it just that we've progressed now that schools provide more nuanced and critical accounts? What may surprise you is that debates over the significance and morality of Columbus's achievement and what followed are long standing. They're not simply a result of contemporary sensitivities or political correctness. The so called black legend portraying Spanish imperialism as rapacious and corrupt, arose as early as the 16th century. Within Spain itself, there are important debates about the ethics of colonialism, such as the 1550 conf confrontation between legal scholar Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda and Dominican friar Bartolomé de las Casas. In 1542, only 50 years after Columbus's first contact, Las Casas wrote a searing expose of Spanish cruelty and genocide of the indigenous population in a book entitled A Short History of the Destruction of the Indies. So it's hardly a novel or radical gesture to post denunciations, say on Facebook, for Columbus Day. As Todorov points out, there's a certain frivolity in merely condemning the wicked conquistadors and regretting the noble Indians as if it sufficed to identify evil in order to oppose it. Such gestures and the questions that prompt them tell us more about ourselves than they do about Columbus or the Spaniards of the 1400s or 1500s. To some extent, that's no bad thing. 1492 is a mythic story, whether the spin is positive or negative. Myths can't easily be surrendered. It's worth asking ourselves why we are so easy to believe them. So rather than trying to replace the myth with some truth, some truth, perhaps it's best to acknowledge the Columbus story as an allegory, an allegory being a literary genre whose true object is missing or displaced. For what's intriguing in reading Columbus's journal is how hard he works, but how quickly he fails to capture his experience in words. I'm not giving it the hundredth part of the praise it deserves, he tells us. No one will believe it unless they see it with their own eyes. Whatever efforts I make to tell your majesties about it, my tongue could not tell the whole truth or my hand set it down. So however little opposition he meets from the indigenous groups themselves, there's something about this place that resists or escapes. Columbus's text battles with a fundamental gap between the thing itself and the means he has to represent it. This is why the journal becomes inescapably literary as he's forced to employ poetic and rhetorical devices such as simile. He's always telling us that what he sees is like something else that is more familiar, like a wax candle, like a horse's tail, like a baker's shovel, but different. Nothing can quite be pinned down, even if it can be bartered, appropriated, or stolen from its rightful owners. His task is to describe what is new, but he can do so only in terms of what is old and familiar. At best, he has to make do with signs, words or things that point to the true object, signs of land, signs of people, signs of reverence, but which can't quite take its place. In the end, 
Columbus's journal charts not simply his way to the Americas, but also the onset of a crisis of representation that will affect modernity as a whole. What comes to be Latin America induces in a particular way an anxiety about our, an, about our inability to communicate, even to say what things are. No wonder the idea of Latin America is so slippery. If it has an essence, perhaps this is it. Thank you.